Okay, um, apparently we're live. Um, so I'll just start with a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, feel free to add any comments that you have in YouTube. The chat is open. So um, if you have any technical issues um, or you you know have any thoughts, then just obviously whack them in there. Um, I'll try and deal with the technical issues at the beginning um, as best I can. Um, and if you have any questions though, please do put them in the Slido. There's also a link to that um, in the show notes as well. Um, and there should have been one, um, there's one on the page as well for the, for the actual event. So hopefully you'll find it there. Um, do upvote the questions that are already in there if you can. It just makes it easier when it comes to the question and answer session. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have um, any feedback about the event, um, there's a feedback link too. So just let us know what you think. Um, we're always trying to improve these events. Um, and also, um, yeah, just there's a link to our resources as well. So I'll mention a little bit more about them later. Um, but yeah, just to uh, to move on, and um, we've today we're really lucky. We've got um, Dr. Mar Fernandez Mendez. Um, she's going to be talking to us about aqua farming the open ocean by combining floating seaweed and artificial upwelling. Um, she has an NSC in microbiology and a PhD in biological oceanography. She has worked at the Norwegian Polar Institute and at the GMI Helmholtz Centre for Ocean Research at Kiel, and now she leads her own research group in the Alfred Wegener Institute at Helmholtz Centre for Polar Marine Research. Her expertise covers a broad range of phytoplankton ecology and primary productivity, marine carbon dioxide removal, artificial natural upwelling systems, climate change impacts on ecosystems, carbon and nutrient biochemistry, carbon export and microbial functional diversity. And she has participated in several seagoing research expeditions from the Arctic to the tropics and is a member of the Ocean Artificial Upwelling Project and a co-founder of Seafields for what she is the um, current scientific advisor. So more than qualified to talk about this today. And so I'll just hand over to you. Thank you so much for having me here today. And hello, everyone. Um, today, I will, I will start by talking a bit about the mess we've made with, with our planet and with the oceans. And then I will move towards a more positive note on what can we do about it and how can we, how can we solve uh, the mess we've made. So, I'm going to start with, uh, with climate change, with what I call the CO2 problem. As you can see here in this uh, very clear graph by Ed Hawkins from, from Reading University, our temperature, our global temperature has already increased by 1.2 degrees. So if you remember what the Paris Agreement is aiming to, to achieve, which is not to go beyond 1.5 or 2 degrees uh, global warming, we're already um, a bit too late for that. So we really need to act uh, at scale and speed as soon as possible. So how do we know that it's CO2? Well, you can see here in this carbon cycle uh, depiction that we are emitting uh, a lot of tons, gigatons of CO2 per year to our fossil fuel uh, combustion. And you can see here that the ones taking up uh, part of that carbon is of course the biosphere, so the plants, on land, but it's actually mostly the ocean. And we have a huge pool of dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean that is helping us um, take up a lot of that carbon. And the rest is of course accumulating and accumulating in the atmosphere, which is what's causing our increase in temperature. Now, how much CO2 does the ocean actually absorb? So um, latest estimates say that it's between 30 and 50% of the CO2 that we produce. So the, the ocean is actually saving us a lot of travel and not only in terms of CO2, but also in terms of heat, as you can see here, the ocean is absorbing 93% of the climate heat. And it also produces oxygen, which is what we breathe. So we should really, really take care of uh, keeping the oceans as healthy as possible because they provide us with a lot of ecosystem services without which we wouldn't be able to exist. So how does the ocean take up carbon? So there are actually two ways. One is what you see on the right, that's the physical carbon pump. So by mixing in the ocean, basically the CO2 from the atmosphere gets equilibrated with the ocean and it gets transported uh, to deeper, deeper layers. And the other one is the biological pump, which is basically fueled by algae, which are like plants uh, on land. They sequester CO2 by photosynthesis. And then that carbon is either sequestered for a long term when it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean, or it can be eaten up and remineralized and goes back to, to the atmosphere. Now, what is happening in the ocean because of that warming? So one of the two of the key uh, things that we see nowadays already is that the Gulf Stream, for example, is already slowing down and that is affecting the weather patterns all over the globe. 
And also that means that there is no more or very less uh, water, deep water formation uh, in the deep sea. So at some point, if we continue this trend, there will be no more oxygen uh, in the deep sea. Another thing that is happening is that the glaciers are, are melting and because they are fresh water, uh, that means that the sea level is rising. So these are two of the canary in the coal mine events that we are observing nowadays that tell us we are already in the midst of a climate crisis that is warming the ocean everywhere on the planet. Now, another effect that might not be so obvious for, for regular people because it's more difficult to see or to measure is ocean stratification. Stratification is basically what you have when you have a Latte Macchiato and you have the two layers. Well, that happens in the ocean as well due to the uh, heat of the sun. The upper layer of the ocean gets uh, stratified, meaning it stays at the top. And because the nutrients are actually in the bottom layers, they are not able to come up. They only come up if the water is mixed or if there's upwelling. And so as the ocean gets warmer, it gets more stratified and less nutrients can come up to the surface. And so the algae do not have nutrients to grow. They have light, but they don't have nutrients. So this is a problem that is happening also worldwide right now. The, all the impacts that we see in the ocean have been very well summarized in the latest IPCC reports. I've named already um, a few with the sea level rise and the ocean heat content. But another effect, for example, is that the pH of the ocean is decreasing. So the ocean is getting more acidic. And this is also a problem for a lot of, um, of organisms, for example, like corals, as you all know. And um, the marine heat waves have increased, uh, causing problems to uh, mammals, birds, a lot of fish, of course. So we have effects all over. And the most astonishing effects are, of course, in the polar regions, which where I work during my PhD, and you can actually see the changes within one's lifetime. I've seen the sea ice cover decrease uh, several million square kilometers within my lifetime, which is pretty scary. Now, what does that mean for biodiversity? So I, I put here two examples. So one is coral reefs that are basically disappearing very, very rapidly because of warming and acidification. And another one is the fish population. So the top predators, they're not only suffering due to global warming, but on top of that, we are overfishing them. So basically they are completely uh, gone and the role that they have in the ocean is not only that we can eat them, <laughs> is actually they, they recycle nutrients at the surface through their feces as well as whales do. And so if we remove all the top predators, we're also in like disentangling a mechanism that would be uh, recycling nutrients at the surface of the ocean. And what we need to remember is that Biodiversity is not only how many species are there, but what do these species do? And that's what we call functional biodiversity. So we need to have different species doing different tasks so that if one dies out, we have another one coming in and doing the same function, because if not, we have, we have a problem. Now, what are ocean ecosystem services? So it's basically all the things that the ocean gives us. And as you can see here, there are many, and we have things uh, from regulating the climate to um, contributing to food supply and food security, protection of uh, coastal areas and protection from natural diseases. And all that is something that the ocean and the seas are giving society. And we need to do something to, to keep that stable. And we need to avoid all these threats that are down here, like climate change, ocean pollution, destruction of coastal and marine habitats and uh, over exploitation of, of resources. Because if not, all these uh, ecosystems will lose their integrity and they will not provide us anymore with all those ecosystem services. Now, one uh, very uh, well-known way to, to go about this is of course conservation. So let's protect uh, huge areas in the ocean I think uh, the aim is to protect at least 30% because till now I think only 2% is protected. So the aim is to protect at least 30% of the ocean and convert some areas into areas where you cannot do fishing, you cannot do anything and just let those areas regenerate. However, there is one problem with this, with this approach and that is that even if you close an area for fishing, which is great, but warming and acidification, they cross boundaries. It doesn't matter if you as a human say, well, this area is protected. If you have corals growing there, they will also be affected by 
um, warming or acidification. So what we need to solve is actual the real problem, which is the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. And here I go to the point of why do we need to start sequestering gigatons of CO2? So of course we need to stop emitting CO2 and that's what we call climate um, mitigation, but we need to start as well removing the CO2 that we have already put in there. We have 1,500 gigatons of historical emissions that we need to remove from the atmosphere because the levels of CO2 that we have in the atmosphere right now are already dangerous for life on the planet and it's getting worse. So it's not only about avoidance of emissions, it's also about removal of CO2. And you can see in this graph that all the paths that lead to either two degrees or 1.5 degrees already count with a certain amount of carbon removal, because we know that there are certain parts of the industry, like for example, the steel industry, that will not manage to be carbon neutral by 2050. So the few emissions that are left, like the difficult to abate sectors, need to be uh, offset by carbon removal. So we need both um, mitigation and carbon removal. Now, what can the ocean offer? So the ocean is not only a victim, this is what I've talked about till now, it can also be a very important part of the solution. And there are several approaches that have been proposed. This is from the Ocean Nets uh, project led by David Keller at uh, Guillomar. And they are looking through modeling how all these uh, technologies that I show here could uh, contribute to CO2 removal from the atmosphere. So we have, for example, um, iron or nutrient fertilization of the ocean to create blooms of algae that would sequester CO2. We have ocean alkalinity enhancement where you put uh, minerals from land and you grind them and spread them in the ocean to uh, reduce the effect of ocean acidification and push uh, the, um, the balance of the ocean towards alkalinity. Then you also have uh, artificial upwelling where you bring the nutrients from the deeper waters to the surface and also enhance uh, phytoplankton blooms. And you also have, of course, all the blue carbon strategies. So uh, increasing the areas where mangroves are growing, where seagrass is growing, and also where macroalgae is growing. And there are others that are more technical, like direct uh, CO2 capture from the water and storing it in the, in the deep surface. So this is just some examples. And uh, I want to go a little bit more in depth into the blue carbon side of things, because that's what I am um, an expert in. And so besides all the coastal um, ecosystems, which not only store carbon in their biomass, but also in the sediment, which is actually the most important part, we have in the open ocean, both the phytoplankton, so that's the tiny macroalgae, but we also have some floating seaweed that I will talk about later that also sequesters carbon in the open ocean. And uh, here in the open ocean, whatever is sequestered for the long term is the ones that go down again to the sediment. Now, there are places in the ocean that are not really productive nowadays. So here you see the chlorophyll concentration in the surface waters in the world ocean. This is the mean annual concentration. And you can see these blue areas that have almost nothing growing in there. So they are called the subtropical gyres and it's what we call the ocean deserts. So actually if we would provide nutrients to those areas, we could transform them into oases or gardens uh, uh, in the middle of, of the ocean. And so one approach to do this would be using artificial upwelling. And this is what I looked at during my postdoc at Geomar in the group of Wolf Riebeser. And so we were testing uh, what happens when you bring deep waters that have a lot of nutrients, but also a lot of inorganic carbon. You bring it to the surface and you try to stimulate a phytoplankton bloom that could both enhance carbon trophic transfer, meaning that the carbon goes to upper trophic levels and you have more fish, for example, or it can contribute to carbon export, meaning much of the biomass that you create and that absorbs carbon then sinks to the bottom of the ocean and you have um, extraction of carbon from the atmosphere. And what we discovered basically is that only if this growth here of the biomass happens at ratios that are higher than the ones of the water that is coming up, then you have a net effect in terms of carbon drawdown. If not, everything that you bring up, you bring down, but the effect is zero, basically. So you need something growing at the surface that has a very high carbon to nutrient ratio, meaning 
an algae that is very efficient in taking up carbon and doesn't require too many nutrients. Phytoplankton microalgae can do this, but usually they have a very close to red field uh, ratio. And that's why then I move towards macroalgae. And there's a wonderful algae that is called sargassum, in this case, sargassum fluitans and sargassum natans. It's a species from the sargassum genus that grows its entire life free floating. So it's basically like phytoplankton, but it's actually a macroalgae. And it grows super fast. It reproduces by fragmentation, meaning it doesn't have any complicated uh, sexual reproduction cycle. It does not require any uh, substrate or attachment like kelp and other macroalgae might need. And it also has a very high carbon to nutrient ratio up to 28 to 50. So just in comparison, phytoplankton usually has between six and 12, sometimes 20 uh, when it gets really um, effective. And um, also it sinks very rapidly. So once this uh, irises, these bubbles that you see here are burst, it can sink really rapidly while phytoplankton usually takes a little bit longer uh, for sinking. Also, this algae is not really tasty, so not many animals um, eat it. That's why it creates uh, huge blooms in the surface of the ocean. Now, from these ideas, uh, and uh, my great mentor, Viktor Smetacek, he came up with this vision of why not farm sargassum in the open ocean in this subtropical gyrus with artificial upwelling. Um, and from this idea, we created together with some entrepreneurs from, from the UK, we created a company called Seafields. You have the webpage here and you can check what they're doing, but basically their aim is to develop um, sustainable open ocean aqua farms that are irrigated with uh, upwelling pipes and they sequester carbon naturally and then they basically bale the sargassum and store it safely in the deep ocean. And I will talk a bit more about this and where we are at um, with, this, uh, with this process right now. So first of all, I'm gonna tell you a bit of where sargassum occurs naturally and, and what is happening right now. So sargassum comes originally from the Sargasso Sea. That's where it was discovered many centuries ago. And uh, it still grows there every year. But in, in 2011, due to climate change, there was a, a very extreme uh, North Atlantic oscillation event and the winds and the currents uh, changed a bit and Sargasso basically escaped the Sargasso Sea. It came almost uh, to the Canary Islands and then it went south and it started creating basically a new population of Sargasso across the Atlantic. And this population continues growing now every year, has a seasonality, so it, it grows mostly uh, in summer and then it decreases a bit in winter. And uh, this belt, because they call it now the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, because it crosses basically from Africa to uh, South America, it's like 8,000 kilometers of patches of sargassum. And um, because of the winds and the currents, it usually ends up in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean is kind of the end of its journey, and some of it goes back to the Sargasso Sea. But it causes huge problems, of course, on the coast of the Caribbean because it lands on the beaches and it can be tons and tons of seaweed and they don't really know what to do with it. I mean, there are few companies working on valorizing this and I will talk about that later, but at the moment it's still um, a problem. So sargassum is not really a, a main food source for, as I said before, for any um, species in particular, it's more like a habitat. And uh, in some cases, it can be between zero and 40% of the carbon supply for some invertebrate and some fish, but mostly it's, it's a nice habitat where turtles can live, uh, baby fish can live, uh, crabs, a lot of other um, little, little creatures. And it's carbon cycle, as I said right now, um, it depends where it ends. So if it comes to the coast, it basically destroys all the nice ecosystems that you have there. So coral reefs, seagrasses and mangroves. So basically mangroves and seagrasses are usually sequestering CO2, but if they get destroyed by sargassum, they stop uh, sequestering CO2. And then when sargassum reaches the coast and it accumulates there on the beach, it starts decomposing and then it actually emits CO2. So if we would manage to avoid that sargassum from reaching the beach, or if we would use that sargassum before it decomposes to create products, you can actually avoid a lot of CO2 emissions. And there are already companies working in this direction. Now, the companies that are working, creating products out of sargassum, they cannot really flourish because they don't have a constant supply of this algae. So that's why Seafields came up with the idea of 
trying to domesticate sargassum and grow it uh, purposely on aqua farms far offshore where it doesn't affect the coast. So trying to prevent damage from the coast and grow it there, both to have a permanent supply for those companies that want to do products out of it, but also to sequester carbon by bailing, like in bricks, the sargassum and sinking it very deep to 4,000 meters deep in the, in the deep sea. And just to point this out again, this is a process that happens in nature anyway. So you can see here a picture of sargassum in the deep sea. This is just about enhancing a natural process. What is the vision? So the vision is we have, as I've explained now, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and the Sargasso Sea. But we want to create aqua farms in the subtropical gyres that would be like oasis in the middle of the ocean. And just for you to have an idea in mind of how much we would need to grow to actually sequester one gigaton of CO2 per year, which is not that much. I mean, we have to globally get to at least 15 gigatons of CO2 per year to get to that area where we managed to go to the two degrees uh, um, global temperature. So this would be just one of the solutions that could be out there. And we would need to have an aqua farm or several aqua, aqua farms that cover an area of 60,000 square kilometers. This is roughly the size of Croatia. And of course, it would be an area that is constantly harvested. So it grows and it's harvested, it grows and it har it's harvested. So it doesn't mean that we grow all at, all at once and then harvest everything at once. Now, we have another project that we just got uh, funding for which is to actually use the sargassum that we create in those aqua farms that I just talked about to create ethanol. And ethanol is a precursor that you can use not only for biofuels, but actually for plastics. And the idea in this case is uh, with the support of a big chemical industry in Germany to have that ethanol as a source for long-term engineering plastics, like the ones we use in our cars or in our computers, because we need those plastics anyways. And right now they're being made from fossil fuels and we want to basically decarbonize the chemical industry and provide them with a abundant enough and, and stable feedstock that comes from a sustainable production. And that would be the sargassum to create the ethanol. So this is something that we're working on at the moment. And we just started phase one and we have to basically prove um, the concept of the aqua farms, prove that the prototype works and then prove that the fermentation pathway from sargassum to ethanol also works. And for that, we're closely collaborating with Carbon Wave, who is a company that already works in, in Mexico and in Puerto Rico, creating products from sargassum. So they've already done, for example, emulsifier, uh, and they've done also vegan leather, and they've done uh, fertilizer out of sargassum. So they're already at the forefront of, of this. Now, in terms of the aqua farming infrastructure, we just started with the trials, and this is from a few weeks ago. So we tested uh, an initial um, barrier to contain the sargassum, and there's still a, a way to go in terms of the engineering, but at least we have a barrier that contains sargassum, so sargassum doesn't escape from the top or from the bottom. And the aim is to have a free-floating uh, barrier that can contain the sargassum in a very large uh, area. In terms of monitoring the sargassum, not only for quantification, but also to detect it if, if for any reason it escapes uh, the barriers, we're using drones. And this is some work we did last year in Mexico. And the nice thing is that we not only had the drones in the air uh, quantifying the patches of sargassum, but we also had people in the water measuring the thickness of the sargassum and the weight of the sargassum. Because actually, from the air, you only see the surface but it can vary a lot. It can be between seven and 80 centimeters deep. And in one square meter, you can have between two and 14 kilos of sargassum. So that is important to know when you want to, to upscale how much sargassum you have there, how much biomass is there. And then in terms of the upwelling, we actually have a, a concept that is relatively old, the stomal pipe principle, but has never been um, created or tested in situ yet. And so we're working now towards making this uh, a reality. And this is a, a pump that works basically using the density gradient of the ocean. So it doesn't require any external energy to bring the nutrients from the deeper waters to the surface. And it also uh, heats the water on the way up, which means that the water that you bring from the deep sea, which is usually colder, would then be warm by the time it reaches the surface. 
and then it will stay at the surface, which is important because in many other types of upwelling, like the wave pump or other types of pumps, the water that they bring up is cold. And so when it reaches the surface, it sinks again. And we want to prevent that because we want to feed our sargassum with, with those nutrients. Now, in terms of sinking uh, the sargassum, I have a little video here from the first test we did. So we process the sargassum, we shred it, and we bale it, we compact it, and then uh, it basically sinks on its own. So it's a very straightforward uh, process, and it's also easy to monitor and to follow and to be able to quantify how much you actually have uh, in the deep sea. Oops. We of course have to um, create a monitoring uh, setup, not only to quantify how much sargassum is there and how it uh, reacts when it's at the deep sea, but also to do an environmental impact assessment to see what the impacts would be uh, in the deep sea. There are a few papers out there that show that sargassum of course reaches the deep sea, for example, in the sargasso sea naturally, and um, it's sometimes being taken by some organisms in the deep sea, but it doesn't seem to be a main food source, food source for, for the benthos. So that gives us an idea that it will, if we bail it also, it will not be accessible. And so it will really stay there for more than a thousand years. And then of course, before we can claim any sort of uh, carbon credits or carbon removal, we have to go, so we're right now here on the feasibility of the approach. So we're trying to, you know, take into account the environmental technological aspects of the approach. Also, of course, that it's economically viable, that it has social acceptance from the institutions and that it has system utility. And then once we have that, we will go into all the steps that lead towards having a carbon credit from each uh, ton of CO2 we sequester. And in that process, we of course have to go through a life cycle assessment. So for example, taking into account all the CO2 emissions that come from the process of creating these farms, uh, you know, monitoring the farms, et cetera. And all that is taken into account to then establish how much um, you have in the end in terms of carbon sequestration. So yeah, that's uh, coming up. And um, I hope that you all understood uh, what the solution, one of the solutions might be. And now I'm very happy to discuss with you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for that. That was really, really comprehensive um, and really interesting. You've got some really amazing slides there as well, really tasty infographics and stuff, which um, yeah, eminently shareable. Um, yeah, well, one, of the, one of the questions that, that's come up is, um, just uh, thinking about what amount of biodiversity would you expect to um, come out of having, you know, increased the amount of biomass in this part of the ocean? Yeah, so we, we definitely expect an increase in biodiversity because right now in those areas, there's not much living there. And we have the example of sargassum growing in the Sargasso Sea and in the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And we see a lot of life, uh, marine life living within uh, this sargassum. So we expect that we would basically replicate that. We would create like this little, I call them oasis uh, in the middle of the ocean and that we would attract uh, fish, turtles, um, crustaceans, et cetera, to live in the sargassum. Are there any kind of numbers on that at the moment? No, I don't think there are any numbers. I think I, until we do it, we will not be able to, to actually measure it. Okay. Um, also, um, there's one in terms of like, there's one question about the possible negative side effects of using artificial upwelling. Um, you know, as, as a technology itself, has there anything that, you know, the overuse of it or the, the poor use of it could, could have on the, on the ecosystems? Um, I mean, you're actually uh, mimicking a, a thing that occurs in nature. So upwelling is something that occurs, uh, for example, in the coast of Peru, of Namibia, and that's why those areas are so productive. So in terms of bringing deep waters to the surface, there is no damage that can be done actually the, the damage is that you increase uh, productivity at the surface um, in terms of the pipes itself yes they, they are 400 meter pipes uh, hanging in the ocean but they are free floating so they're not anchored so it's really difficult for any marine life to to get entangled with something that is free floating if i, I mean it's just a tube so um, we don't expect any negative ex um, effects in that respect. However, we will, of course, monitor it. And when we have the first prototype, that will be one of the first things that we will look at if there are any uh, bad uh, effects on the, on the fauna around it. 
Are there any thoughts on trying to address the problems that are happening in the Mediterranean? Is it also Western Africa that's also being affected by um, these increased blooms of this um, of the sargasso seaweed? Yeah, so West Africa has uh, sargassum problems as well, yes. And the Mediterranean has other problems with another uh, invasive, uh, another species that is invasive in the Mediterranean. So sargassum is not really invasive because it has always been in the Atlantic. Uh, but in the Mediterranean, they have other problems. And I would say the problem of trying to prevent sargassum from reaching the coast is actually not that easy to solve because you have to remove the actual reason why sargassum is growing like crazy. And that is basically global warming and an extra input of nutrients from, um, from um, animal farms along the Amazon River and the Congo River, etc. So that's where all this extra runoff of nutrients is coming into the ocean. That's what's creating these huge masses of sargassum naturally right now. So if you don't solve that problem, it's going to be very difficult to solve the issue of sargassum reaching the coast. You also looked at a lot of the kind of industrial applications of it. Um, I read a paper a little while ago about how it's quite good for making into charcoal for biochar. Um, yeah. Is that something that's also been looked at? And yeah. Uh, yes, there is one company um, working into that as far as I know. There might be more that I don't know about. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good approach. The only problem that I see with charcoal is that it's very energy intensive because you need to burn basically by pyrolysis the, the biomass. And so you have to dry it first and then burn it. So you need a lot of energy for the process. Uh, but for example, what we're looking at for the plastic uh, project is that we, through anaerobic digestion, that we produce biomethane that could fuel the whole process. So if in the process of creating the biochar, you create enough energy to fuel your own process, then then maybe it makes sense, yes. And just one last question from me um, about the agricultural side of it. If we're using um, things like biochar and also saying about agricultural fertilizers, um, have you done any work on how much that may offset the initial problem of, of the eutrophications of the oceans being over fertilized by agricultural runoff? So I haven't done the calculations myself, but I know that Carbon Wave has done those calculations because they they create products like fertilizer out of sargassum and they of course want to uh, also look at how much CO2 or avoided emissions they manage to create with each of their products. So they have those calculations and I don't remember the number right now, but it's it's definitely out there and it's a lot. I mean creating fertilizers uh, on land for the land uh, agriculture is very, very uh, CO2 intensive. So if you remove that step, you're definitely uh, avoiding CO2 emissions. I suppose as well, there'd be less eutrophication of the oceans, potentially, if we needed less fertilizer as well. But um, uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple of quick announcements while I get some more questions to come in. Um, but just to say that um, um, we're, we're currently looking for volunteers for people to um, come and help us out. There's always plenty of work to do. Um, we've also been building up our pages on what you can do about climate change. So do check out the resources in our link tree on there. Um, it's in the show notes. And um, also we're, we're trying to list all the sustainability groups within the public sector in the UK. So if you have one, then again, you can um, let us know um, in uh, one of the links on our link tree page. That's obviously in the show notes, um, just to make sure we can make sure we can kind of signpost everyone to um, where they need to go, what the best community for them is. Um, and also, um, even even the World Economic Forum, like the bunch of you know faceless billionaires um, from from Davos, they 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 even say like joining a group is one of the most useful things you can do. Um, and you know just just by like being more active on our community um, Slack workspace, it's really really useful just to have your conversations about um, what you're doing on there. Um, I heard recently that um, we've got to try and make the community more visible to itself so that we can see what we're actually doing. Um, so if you can just go on there and just be like a shameless self-promoter um, talking about what you're doing, um, then that information will reach the people who want to know about it because that's how Slack works. Um, so um, I'll leave that there, but um, we'll just go to some of the questions. Um, and one of the first one is, um, what, uh, thanking you for your um, really interesting talk, but also what are the main barriers to making this a reality? Um, this is probably a basic question, but like in terms of... Um, who controls and regulates the oceans, maybe international agreements, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, the legal framework is, of course, something that we're working on in parallel. So I would say the main challenge right now is an engineering challenge. So we're working with engineers to basically crack open ocean aquafarming. 
mine, which is something that has never been done till now, and open ocean artificial lab welling with the stomal pipe. This is something completely new. So that's the first challenge. But in parallel, of course, we're working with, um, with legal advisors that know about the law of the ocean. And um, right now, there is no law that prohibits this. So all of this is allowed. However, uh, we, of course, have to check before we deploy the first uh, prototypes, and et cetera. We need to ask for permits wherever we're going to do it. And if it's at an international waters, we need to double check all the laws like the London Protocol, et cetera, to be sure that we are within uh, what is legal. And probably, to be honest, as the ocean carbon dioxide removal community starts growing now, this is a whole new industry. So new laws will have to be created to, to you know, make this possible because things like ocean alkalinity enhancement are not allowed right now because it's considered dumping. But eventually we will have to find a way to, to do this. Once we have proved that scientifically, you know, it has no environmental impacts that are worse than climate change, then um, we will definitely have to change the legal framework. Because there, there was a reason to be famous ban of iron fertilization after a rogue experiment was done on that, wasn't there, um, off in, in the North Pacific, I think. Yeah, so uh, it was after the Loafex experiment led by Viktor Smetacek, my mentor, so I know the story very well. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a little bit of a story of sometimes uh, some groups not wanting to really listen to what the scientists had to say and just, uh, you know, saying, oh, this is going to be terrible without any background. And the only thing that is banned is to do it commercially, but actually to do scientific experiments is still, it's still allowed within the London, London Protocol. And that's what uh, I think it's coming back now, to be honest. I think iron fertilization will also come back because in terms of the ocean CDR approach, this is one of those that is, is at the forefront because so many experiments have been done already. So we know a lot already. And so now that it's coming back, it will probably be able to be deployed uh, pretty fast. And where would you be sourcing it from? Is it a question of just fertilizing what's already there? You mean the iron or do you mean the biomass? Oh, the that biomass to start the process off, you know. Yeah, so in our case, we're going to source it from the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. We're going to harvest uh, a few tons from the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt to initiate the farm. And then because it grows by fragmentation, you don't really need uh, seeds or anything like that, like you would need with kelp, for example. So sargassum is way easier in that respect. Um, there, there is a question about um, the actual the pipe itself and how it stays upright um, and basically mm -hmm. how it kind of largely works. Do you, could you do a quick explainer of that? Well, I mean, the only thing I can say till now is that it will have, of course, a buoy at the, at the surface and a weight at the bottom to make it stay like this. Uh, but no, there's not in, no information yet on what exactly the material will be. You know, as I said, this is the first challenge. This is the one we're working on right now with engineers trying to model it, trying to design it. So this is still um, happening. So there's no specific answers yet uh, to that. Um there's another question here about um, how long do you think it's going to be um, before you, well, until you can get this actually formally certified as an offsetting technology? So the estimate is that once we have the first prototype, which we hope to have in a year time, um, that then the, the app scaling will take, let's say, maybe three years, something like that. And the carbon credit verification will run in parallel. And that usually takes about a year. Uh, but of course, it depends on how much back and forth there will be with the verification agency in terms of agreeing on a, on a methodology. That's how it's called. So that we have started already the first um, communications with the verification agencies. And as we move forward and we have a prototype, I would say within a year um, from the prototype on, it would be feasible to have carbon credits. Um I um, read from a paper in 2012 um, when I was looking into this kind of stuff ages ago. Um, there's a chap called Nyertz, like an engineer, and he was talking about potentially capturing like 50 plus gigatons a year using this kind of technology. Um, always like, you know, massively over optimistic, like the Crowther tree paper and all that kind of stuff. Um, but is there is there a way to, is there a way that you can imagine capturing more than um, just like, a, I know a one gigaton is not... Um, a, a menial amount, but is there a way to scale it up to increase that? Um, yeah, so wait, did this person say he's going to do it with artificial lab welling or with biomass like aqua farming of seaweed? Um, it was actually sargassum, um, and but the idea would be to um, 
I think some of the ideas were to fertilize the, the top of the ocean with actual fertilizers that had just been they'd just be released by ships and stuff on the surface to keep it going. Yeah, okay. um, so in theory, the limits are the space and, and the nutrients, right? Those are the limiting factors. And so, yes, you could sequester more than one gigaton per year. As you saw, the area that we need for one gigaton per year is relatively small if you look at the whole ocean. So yes, one could upscale it more, definitely. And 50 gigatons, don't think so. Uh, but I would say, you know, five might be something realistic, uh, maybe even more. I mean, I wouldn't dare to say more because I first want to see the, you know, the first uh, aqua farms up and running. But in theory, yes, you know, the, the space is the limiting factor and the open ocean has a lot of space available. And if you have a good source to bring nutrients from, which is also the problem, I mean, one issue that if there's any modeler in the room, they will tell you, you know, if you take out nutrients from one place, they are missing somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Even if you take them from the deep sea where the pool of nutrients is huge. However, our approach is to actually, before we sink the seaweed, we extract the nutrients again and give it back to the upper layers. So it's important to have a recycling mechanism for the nutrients so that you don't lose them. Because if not, at some point, that is definitely a limiting factor and it will be removing nutrients from somewhere else. So, for example, if that approach requires fertilizer that would otherwise be needed on land, for example, then you're kind of not solving the problem. Yeah, that was one of the thoughts I was having about it. And, and also about this technology itself, um, you're saying it's, it's good to talk about how you need to recycle it. But that was one of the things I was thinking, is it, you say there's like a huge amount of, um, there's a huge amount of nutrients just sitting on the, on, well, in, in the lower ocean, I suppose. Um, but that's just floating around in the water column, isn't it? So you're not mining the sediment or anything like that to get those no, nutrients. No, no, no. no, so if you imagine this, these pipes are at, go down to 400 meters, but they're floating in a water column that is 4,000 meters deep. So you're basically tapping the nutrients from below the surface, like at 400 meters. You're not going anywhere deeper to the sediments for the nutrients. Um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the, comments here is about um, how we very quickly, you know, and the stuff I'd read before as well was talking about this, like making, turning this into a biofuel, you know, and being something that we can combust and obviously produce more CO2. It's carbon neutral, but it's like, yeah, it's stopping us from producing as much carbon, but it's obviously not stopping us from. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree. Biofuels are a bit dangerous because um, people think they can continue business as usual, just changing the thing they're burning. Um, they can be a solution in certain cases, so I'm not completely against them. And there are a few projects looking into doing biofuels from sargassum. However, sargassum's uh, lipid content is relatively low, and so it's not really good for biofuel. It's better for other things, but there are other seaweed, other algae that might be better for, for biofuel. But yeah, that in the best case brings you to net zero. It doesn't bring you to carbon sequestration. Um. What other technologies are ones to watch that you're aware of um, that could provide substantial kind of sequestration opportunities? In, in the oceans, I think um, besides uh, seaweed uh, aqua farming, ocean alkalinity enhancement is being pushed uh, a lot right now. Um, I think they need to solve a few issues, I think, because it would require mining of minerals to bring them to the ocean, but there are now some approaches that um, that use electrochemical separation and then you create the alkalinity from the water itself. The problem is you have a site waste product like acid. So if you manage to convince the chemical industry to use those liters and liters and liters of acid, then maybe that's a good approach. So I think all the approaches right now have to be very careful with assessing the whole approach as an entire life cycle and not just looking at one thing. But I think ocean alkalinity enhancement will definitely one on the plate. Um, I think on land, there's also some alkalinity enhancement and some ecosystem restoration, and not only restoration, but uh, expansion, meaning restoring is good, as I said before, but you need to additionally sequester carbon. So for example, expanding mangroves, expanding seagrasses, as much as you can, that should be done. Expanding kelp forests, all the areas that can be used for expanding those ecosystems, it should be done. Um, oh, this is a really interesting one. Um, would you, what do you think, have you looked at what the um, impact on the albedo effect would be? 
by having such huge areas? Yeah, so there is a, a paper uh, that does some back of the envelope calculations saying that the albedo effect of sargassum is actually as powerful as, uh, as the carbon sequestration effect in terms of cooling the planet, because the sargassum reflects uh, more light than the open ocean. And uh, we are currently developing a, a drone with an albedo sensor to be able to measure large mats of sargassum and measure, measure the albedo on top of them to actually prove this, uh, this concept. So we think it might have a very, very beneficial effect on the cooling of the planet. Yeah. Um, so kind of how, how widespread do you think the technique could be? Um, yeah, how widely could it be used in the oceans, do you think? I think it could be used in all the subtropical gyres. So, I mean, basically the entire ocean is, uh, is available for this. It's just a matter of cracking the way to actually having the sargassum in a contained barrier and making it be happy enough so that it grows out there. But I think there's very few limits. And I mean, at the same time, because you're doing this in the open ocean, you're removing pressure from the coast. So you're not cramping the coast with, uh, with seaweed aqua farms or anything like that. So you're really going somewhere where where you don't bother anyone. Of course, you need to take into account shipping routes and other things. So that is something that needs to be taken into account when you think about upscaling. But I think the surface of the ocean is huge. I mean, just because now Victor always says this, because we're now used to flying over the Atlantic in a few hours, we have forgotten how huge the ocean is. But actually, you know, it's there's a lot of space out there. So is there it's the classic invasive species argument, but is there potential to be using this in, in the Pacific as well then? Exactly. In the Pacific, it would be an invasive species in this case, but yes, you could also grow it in the Pacific if you wanted to. And um, there's also sargassum species in the Pacific, but they are benthic, they're not uh, free floating. So one could also try to domesticate the benthic species to grow it um, on the surface. That could also be done. Um, are there any kind of, can you foresee any kind of conflicts with regards to the kind of space and the ge geographical area with, with other industries? Obviously, you've, you've mentioned shipping already, but. Yeah, I think shipping or fishing might be the ones that are mostly um, in conflict with, with open ocean aqua farms. But I think it's in this, the same as we do it on land, right? We also have transportation and we have agriculture. So it should be the same. You know, you should have areas where you have your farms and areas where you have the routes, the main routes of. Uh, of shipping and I, I do think that the fishing industry in the end they will be happy about this because this this um, ocean gardens or oasis they will act as nurseries for fish and so actually around this farm they will probably find much more catch than they find right now because right now they don't really go to fish to the subtropical gyres because there's nothing there they go on the coast you know on the Namibian coast on the Peruvian coast they don't go to the middle of the Atlantic but now, you know, if we you have these farms that are habitat for, for fish and other species, they might want to start fishing around them. So that's kind of, um, that's a really interesting kind of uh, side benefit of all of this. And thinking about when you look at lots of carbon capture technologies, um, I've heard them say that there's um, described as having a compliance market. So you're basically buying credits um, for offsetting your pollution, basically. But there's not really, you know, the consumer of those credits they're not going to get anything from a direct air capture program, for example. You know, they won't get any products at the end of it. But like, um, you know, for example, fishermen will get, um, you know, they could get a benefit from this. And obviously there's there's markets for all the products that you can make from the actual seaweed itself. Do you feel yeah. like that? Because um, this, this doesn't feel like a leading technology at the moment. You know, we're still lots of focus on, you know, capturing carbon out of the atmosphere and, um, and well, I think starting to look at it from the oceans in, you know, technical ways. But do you think that's like a that should be like a massive advantage to this as an industry to go? I think so. And I mean, as soon as carbon credits start reflecting not only how much carbon is sequestered, but they start reflecting for how long the carbon is sequestered and what are the environmental co-benefits or social co-benefits of the of the activity, then you know, the carbon credits derived from such a farm will be much more valuable. And again, um, the farms are not a monocultural culture that is used only for one thing. It's a mixed culture. So there's few, three different uh, morphotypes of sargassum growing in those uh, mats. And you can grow other species with them. They don't need to be just sargassum. And then it can be used for different things. You can use uh, one tenth of the farm for cosmetic products and one tenth of the farm for biofuel and one tenth for whatever. And so 
you have a variety, you have a, 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 an economic model that is basically resistant. Because if one thing uh, gives you more revenue than another, you can shift a bit your plantation, so to say, to, to provide more for one or for the other. And so I think that that's, uh, that's the beauty of, of seaweed and especially sargassum, that it's so, um, yeah, you, it can give you so many different things. Yeah, I did read, there's an FAO report um, that I was having a look at the other day and they're talking about making it into bricks for houses as well, just another <laughs> like a building material. Um, already doing concrete out of sargassum, sarga creto. Wow. Um, uh, sorry, I just hopped some more questions. Um, oh yeah, sorry, this is a really good one. Um, I've, I've seen this before, but in terms of like, um, you know, plastics floating in the oceans, is that a way we can harvest this at the same time and like separate out the plastics to remove them from the oceans too? Yeah, exactly. So um, the areas, the subtropical gyres are also the areas where we have the, the big uh, plastic patches because they stay in there because it's a gyre, right? And so um, I know that we have, for example, the ocean cleanup right now going with boats out there and collecting the plastic and bringing it back to land and so on. But if you think about it, that is very energy intensive. And so I would rather argue that we will have some plastic mixed up in our sargassum anyways, because the oceans are unfortunately full of plastic. And so I would go for when we bail it and just sink it with it. And it will, I mean, plastic also contains carbon. So if you store it in the deep sea, it will also stay there forever and it will not go back to the atmosphere. If you bring it back to land and it ends in the landfill and you burn it, that's way worse than if you just sink it down with the sargassum. So that could be an option. And I mean, it could also be maybe recycled with the sargassum, the part that uh, goes to land. So I, I think it's going to come into play and we will just um, take it as it comes. Yeah. And with regards to, um, you know, burying it, like just sinking this to the bottom of the ocean, just for context, this that's effectively like geological storage, isn't it? It's not going anywhere. It's not getting back into any real ecosystem of any note. Is that correct? No, exactly. So basically, the aim is that by bailing the sargassum, so that if we would just sink the sargassum as it is, then probably a, a X percentage of it will be eaten by the benthic fauna or by the bacteria, and it will be, go back to the dissolved inorganic carbon pool. And then depending on the depth that we're talking about, it will go back to the atmosphere maybe in 700 or 1,000 years, depending where you are. So I'm talking now 4,000 meters depth in the middle of the Atlantic. It would get back to the atmosphere in like 750 years, something like that. Um, however, we expect that most of it will be either sinking into the sediment because you have this huge compact bales and the rest that is in the bale is like hay balls, you know, like the inside will never be reached by, by bacteria or by any kind of degradation. So that's, that's what we have to test now. We are deploying the first bales uh, end of this year and then testing them in a, in a year from now to see what actually happened to them. But that's the expectation that by bailing, we basically reduce that remineralization and we reduce the amount of carbon that goes back into the dissolved uh, form. And um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, because um, when, when this floats out over uh, mangrove forests and you know coastal areas and stuff and it runs out of its nutrients, um, I've read that it then produces arsenic. Is that correct? Um, or so, what is it? What is it? It breaks down to some really toxic um, chemical that just like really damages biodiversity. Um, mm. Is that is that something that would be avoided? Is it effectively you know is, is that because of aerobic respiration is being broken down by bacteria in an oxygenated environment or? No. So what what happens is that because sargassum goes floating all over the the ocean basically it accumulates arsenic, arsenic that is naturally in the water, but it just accumulates it. And so when you capture it at the end of its life cycle, when it reaches the coast in, in Mexico, for example, and you measure the arsenic content of sargassum, it can be a bit higher than, than average. And that's why if you have huge accumulations of sargassum um, on the coast and, and it leaks to the, for example, the cenotes in Mexico, the groundwater system, it can also contaminate it with things like, like arsenic. But basically, arsenic in the natural system for the algae is a substitute for phosphate. So they take it up thinking that it's phosphate, but it's arsenic. And that's why they bioaccumulate it. So actually, sargassum is in some way cleaning the ocean from arsenic. It's taking it up. 
So if you actually take the sargassum and sink it, you're sinking the arsenic with it and removing it from the from the upper layers. Um, you mentioned an increase in some of the fish species. Do you offhand know any of the like like the, the size and type of species that they would be we would expect to see them? Yeah, so the ones that will most probably uh, naturally come and live in the sargassum are uh, small crabs like this big. Um, some amphipodes and like some shrimp type uh, uh, zooplankton species. They are also contributing to recycling the nutrients within the within the sargassum. And then in terms of bigger animals, you have the sargasso fish that looks actually like sargassum. It's very difficult to differentiate it from the sargassum because it has developed to mimic completely the colors and the shape of the of the sargassum. I had once one right in front of me, and I was not seeing it until it jumped. So it's just really amazing what nature what nature has developed. And um, and then um, uh, blue fin tuna has been observed in the Sargasso Sea, growing below, like swimming below Sargassum, and turtles. Uh, turtles also like uh, to live in the Sargassum, and uh, dolphins as well. So they like to play with the Sargassum. It has been observed that they swim and play with the with the Sargassum. So we expect a whole range, basically, of um, of uh, animals living in there. Uh, oh yeah, someone talking about um, how you know you're using drones at the moment to see it, but is there a point where we would reach the areas are so huge that um, actually we'd be wanting to look at satellite measurements to see to monitor it from a day to day basis? Yeah. So um, currently, the Sargassum, the Great Atlantic Sargassum patch, is um, is monitored by satellites. That's how we know that it's there and how big it is. Um, yes, eventually when the farms get big enough, you will also see them from satellite and you can monitor them from satellite. Um, however, satellites have two problems. Uh, one is that uh, you usually get the information from the day before. So it's kind of like you want to know where your farm is now, but you get the information from yesterday. So it's not very direct. And the second one is the resolution that they have. So sometimes it's a 20 kilometer resolution. and so. You know, depending how big your farm is, you might see it or not. Um, and they can also not really see the depth of the sargassum. So they just see, okay, there there is sargassum and there there's not, but they don't know if the farm, let's say this way, is full of sargassum or it only has a, a little bit of sargassum on the surface. So I think it will always be a combination of both, of satellites and uh, in situ drone uh, service. But maybe not the type of drones we're using now. It might be more like this fixed wing drones that can go kilometers uh, from out from the base. Yeah. Um, just a thought on, um, I know we had Pete Irvine, who you did a talk with um, a few few months ago. Um, he's ta talked and thought and researched a lot about, you know, what would happen if we couldn't continue with their solar radiation management technology, you know, trying to make sure that that was resilient. And, you know, what's what's the, have you thought about what the worst that could go wrong if this was managed badly or, um, you know, say another pandemic happened and you know, we didn't end up being able to man the pumps, as it were, those kinds of things? You mean what could go wrong with the farms or if we don't manage to create the farms in the first place? Um, just if it got, if it became this huge expansive industry um, and just making sure that it kept on going, I suppose we're looking at automation over the next few decades mm -hmm. quite substantially. Um, but is there... Yeah, I suppose people, people when they look at this, they'll be thinking, what, what's going to go wrong? Is this humanity meddling with, by, with nature again? And we're just basically, you know, creating a, a, a disaster waiting to happen. Have you thought about what the, you know, the problems could be in future? Um, so first of all, before I start about the problems, we need to think that there's an entire industry that right now still has a lot of people working for it. That's the oil and gas industry that will need something else to do in the upcoming year. So I envision a lot of people transitioning from oil and gas jobs to open ocean aquaculture uh, jobs. So I think we will have a lot of people that will be willing um, to work for this, especially in the global south. And in terms of what could go wrong if, you know, suddenly we cannot maintain this, whatever. Well, worst case scenario, the pipes will sink down to the deep sea, also sequestering the carbon in the materials that they <laughs> that they were made from. Um, and then, yeah, you would need to collect the, the barrier basically and, and bring it back. And then the rest of the sargassum will sink or worst case scenario, it will end on some beach. Although I don't think that would happen because they are inside the subtropical gyre. So it would probably end up like a new 
sargasso sea uh, in there. And that's it. I mean, this huge sargassum blooms occur right now in nature. Like this is not something new. So the worst case scenario you're already seeing, it's beaches fall off um, of sargassum. That's, I guess, the worst case scenario. Um, OK. Um, that's it's interesting because um, talking to um, like Peter before his talk, he seems quite sanguine about climate risks, um, and he talks quite a lot about. I see him on Twitter doing this as well, but he talks quite often about how his concern is largely that people are worrying too much about this issue, um, and being connected to a technology like he is, um, it's. I wonder if that kind of changes his thoughts because at the back of my mind, I think about you know the massive impacts that we would have from temperature changes um, and you know, our inability or our current failure to roll these, indus these industries or technologies out quickly enough and research them quickly enough. Um, but if you, at the back of your mind, to me it feels like after listening to his talk, it was just inevitable that this was going to be used at some point just because we're going to want to turn off the heat at some point. Um, does that, when you think about, like, your technology is obviously a slower moving one, um, you know, the effects will be, you know, considered over decades rather than, you know, years or months even potentially. Um, how do you feel about, you know, the prospects for the future, um, given that you're in one of these solution based disciplines in the climate space? Yeah, I, I do agree with the sentence that people are worrying too much about the side effects or the potential negative impacts of this type of uh, ocean carbon dioxide removal technologies might have because they are losing perspective of what is at risk if we don't do this. And this is what people keep forgetting, you know, like if we don't deploy this type of uh, large scale uh, technologies to sequester gigatons of CO2, then the deep sea is going to become anoxic, the surface of the ocean has become very much non-productive because of stratification so we're going to have all these problems you know loss of biodiversity rolling onto us i mean it's already happening and so when people tell me oh how is this going to impact biodiversity and i'm like well definitely better than what's going to happen if we don't do this so i always when i think about for example the deep sea environmental impact assessment i mean sure bringing tons and tons of biomass to the deep sea will have an impact but we need to compare that impact to what would happen if we wouldn't deploy these technologies. And what climate change is making to our planet is already a geoengineering project. And we've been running this for 100 years now. And now we're seeing the, you know, we're starting to see the effects and we don't know what the effects will be in many cases because we will reach tipping points that will throw the whole system out of balance and we will be surprised that things are happening and then there will be no way back. So for me, we need to be brave. We need to be, you know, researching this. We need to be careful, of course, but we shouldn't be overly careful and have fear of, you know, doing things. Because in this case, for example, sargassum, the nature is already doing it. Nature made sargassum, escape the sargassum sea, create this huge bloom across the Atlantic. And to me, this is like a very neat example of the Gaia hypothesis. The world is trying to regulate itself. And it's giving us hints on which options would be feasible. I mean, algae have been regulated atmospheric concentrations in terms of oxygen, for example, for geological timescales. And so we just need to learn that and make use of it. And it's the same with solar radiation management. I mean, we see the effect immediately when a volcano starts erupting. So it's just learning from nature and trying to apply it in the best way we can, because as he said, at some point, we will not have another choice. And we are already too late on this, unfortunately. We should have looked for solutions years ago, decades ago, but we're leaving it to the last minute. OK, well, um, I still think uh, it's obviously not the most positive note to, that to end on. But of course, it does. It's just a very urgent one, isn't it? It is that we have to you know, really take action and pay attention to what's going on um, yeah. and try and understand the, 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 you know, the, the issues and the solutions. Um, I'll leave the kind of session today there um, and just to say, um, yeah, thanks very much for doing this. I've, I've personally been really excited to, to like, learn more about this. I've been interested in it for years. Um, and uh, yeah, it was um, it's great to see you've just covered such a wide area of it um, and you know, answered so many great questions. Um, and also just thinking about how so much of the impacts of this or you know, the problems we see in the ocean, the kind of ones that are unseen. Um, but um, it's great to see more kind of visibility on 
on all of this and seeing a great solution um, being kind of talked about. So um, yeah, thanks thanks for joining us, um, and um, I'll just uh, just end it there. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure and a very nice discussion. Thank you.